Hey boss, how you doing? Got a quick minute? Uh, you studying? What are you doing right now? Just taking a break, yeah. Well, let me see. Uh, my name is Xavier, first of all. Uh, it's a pleasure. Right. We're just here out with uh, some people from Cornerstone Baptist Church, talking to people in the community, students, um, you know, just kind of sharing with them, uh, encouraging them to consider the truths of the gospel. Um, do you happen to, in any way, shape, or form, be involved with any form of religious organization or entity or anything like that? Church? Uh, I did a little bit back home. Not oh. too much here. Oh, good. Well, what are you, where, where were you from? <laughs> uh, Tiesville. Tiesville? Okay. Um, and when you say you were involved like, with some like Red Cross, what were you involved with? It was a local Methodist church. And oh, good. Youth group, stuff like that. Good, good. So you guys were like involved in the church? You guys do any type of like outreach and stuff like that or just in the church? Um, we did some stuff with the youth group, but... Could, so would you consider bit. yourself to be a born-again Christian? Yeah. Okay. What would be, um, uh, what I'll do is this, because you're eating, I'll talk and you eat, because the whole point of resting would be for you to eat. <laughs> so essentially, uh, my encouragement or when I like to talk to people is to get them to really think about and consider. So for example, in your case, someone says, you know, I believe I'm a Christian, right? I believe that, uh, you know, uh, what the Bible says, I believe that, you know, there's a God. I believe that, you know, um, again, I'm assuming some of you believe that there's sin, that there's right and wrong, you know, that there's an idea of judgment, there's an idea of heaven, uh, you know. But what really comes down to the challenge here becomes, because a lot of people claim to be someone who goes to church, right? Uh, and if you live in what's called the Bible Belt, right, more to like, you know, that North Carolina, North Carolina area, Georgia, like everybody goes to church, Alabama, you know, everybody's a Christian, you know. Mm -hmm. But then have you ever noticed, and has this been a concern possibly, maybe, maybe not, that a lot of people who claim to be Christian, they don't really, um, their lives are kind of many times not reflecting what they claim perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so then the question becomes, one must have to deal with, the, with that idea and say, okay, well, maybe is it because A, multiple choice, no one's perfect, B, uh, maybe I just ran into them on a bad day, or C, uh, they're probably not a Christian, but for some reason they think they are. Now, there's different ways to go through that, right? If you know a person for quite a bit of time, uh, you would be able to definitely say that, well, you know, maybe it's just a bad day. Because you know them. You know the pattern of life, the way they speak, the way they live their life. Um, but if someone, you know, that you maybe didn't know, then, you know, would be maybe, you know, sick or under the weather. You know, I mean, even Christian people sin, not the same way everyone else outside of Christ. But then the question begs, if this person, you do know them, right, and this person is not one who's living according to God's word, then you would have to, uh, not in like a judgmental way, but you would have to judge the book by its cover. If it says biology, it's probably a biology book. If the, bi you know, if the book says in this case that the person lives like a devil, but claims to be a Christian, they're probably not a Christian. Now, the question is in your case, one of the things that I think might help you out is the idea of uh, what's, what's found in the scriptures. Uh, do you have a Bible? Mm -hmm. Read it quite a bit now, maybe? From no, time to time, remember the last thing you read possibly in the Bible. If you don't, that's fine. No, I don't okay. Know. So there's, there's something that might be encouraging that is as you uh, sit here and eat, and I'll tell you what the Lord Jesus Christ says, which is always encouraging because um, Christ just he, the Bible says that His words are life. So uh, in Matthew chapter five, right? It's one of the Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter five. There's a little bit of information that I think would be helpful on something that um, you would have to consider as a professing Christian. Now, I do want you to understand this. I, in no way, right, I just met you, I don't say and believe that you're not a Christian. I don't know you. But what the Bible does encourage me to do is to maybe, by way of reminder, go to the Scriptures, right, and encourage you by what the standard that Christ has to, so you can check yourself. The Apostle Paul says that we should check ourselves to see if we're in the faith, right? Mm -hmm. So here's what, what uh, Christ says in Matthew chapter 5. It's called uh, it's the Sermon on the Mount, but then he goes into the Beatitudes. You ever heard of the Beatitudes? I'll read them to you. It says, uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 2 and on. And he opened his mouth and taught them, Jesus, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Number two, blessed are, the, are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Number three, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, number four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Number five, Blessed are the pure, um, sorry, the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Six, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Number seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Uh, and number eight, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, 
for theirs is the kingdom of God. And here's the last one. Check this one out. It's very interesting. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, is what Jesus said. Here's what he says after that, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And obviously he's talking about prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, they got killed and murdered, you know, because of the fact that pe the people of Israel were idolatrous people. They are just people that didn't want to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we're looking at the Beatitudes, something that's really interesting is that every single one of these things is describing the life of a Christian. Now, you would agree that if a baby's born and the baby's normal, it's born with all its parts, right? Now, an abnormal baby is born maybe when he's missing like a hand, or maybe there's some type of abnormality. Abnormality, the word itself is that it's anormal, right? So it negates. Uh, now, when we look at these, we'll start with the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What would be, right, in, in short, what's your conversion story? Like, how did you come to the conclusion, right, that you were poor in spirit? Well, it was like middle school time, hanging out with some friends, mm -hmm. and then they're real nice family and stuff, and did, uh, with you, the leader, or their parents were the leader of the youth group, mm -hmm. and went and did all that, and then went to, um, like, a church camp one summer before high school, and that was just, like, kind of a big thing at the time. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, that particular moment, uh, what was it that you came to understand that allowed you to believe, right, that at, at that moment that you're a Christian, that you were born again? I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, right, that that was an experience? Yeah. What happened? What was it that took place that led you to believe after that? Man, I'm, I'm born again. I'm saved. Well, we were up there. It was in, uh, it's not it. It was in Tennessee. No, it's not. Eagle Rock. I don't know if you've heard of it. Like, about I don't know too much, but I've driven, and it's beautiful. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> like up in the mountains. Yeah. And um, they had a little ceremony for people who's their first time there and who and then we went to this other room where if you were feeling mm -hmm. like you needed to you know change a little bit kind of thing not that i was into bad stuff I've always been a good kid so i've never been in trouble or anything mm -hmm. but we're well, good just uh went there and then you just feel it hit you you know mm -hmm. like just what, it was what, just weird i don't know yeah what was it that hit you what, what, what was the information you received that really just devastated you I don't know. That was the it, was just, it was just like you just felt something. Yeah, that was like it was weird. something was drawing you to say, man, I I need to do this. I need to, I guess, pray to accept Jesus in your heart. Was that kind of what they were leading you guys to do? What, what were you guys yeah, doing? Yeah, it was like that. And then it was with a few of my close friends and stuff too. And it's like a small, quiet room thing. And mm -hmm. yeah, that was the weirdest thing. Is like when it hit you, it was like you didn't really know. I didn't really know what was hitting me. You just you just, just felt something. It's some, yeah. something. Yeah, something maybe perhaps supernatural, if you will. Right. Okay. So it's important to understand, right, that if you're born again, that there's this understanding, right, of being, uh, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So one of the things that I guess it's really neat that we do get to talk, and I thank God for the opportunity to meet you, is, you see, people, people don't get saved um, because of an experience, yes? Because that would almost lend to be challenging to the following. I talk to Mormons uh, and evangelism and Hindus and Muslims and things like that, and and uh, some people that are charismatic and, you know, and, uh, and, and they'll say, man, I, you just got to feel in your heart. You got to pray, right, to God and feel in your heart, right, that this is true. And here, here's the question, though. At the end of the day, do we use that form of logic for anything else in life in order to measure the veracity of the truth of something? In other words, what are you studying here at UCF? Engineering. Okay, engineering. Does that work in any way, shape, or form in engineering? In other words, do you say, listen, guys... Uh, at the end of this chapter, I just, you know, I know we didn't get to finish, you know, the other half of the book, but I just want you guys to just close your eyes and, you know, and just, and just feel that everything else is true. I know we haven't covered it. I got a bunch of questions. You're probably going to fail it. But listen, I just want you to close your eyes and feel right based on the first half of the book that the rest half is true. Do we, is that how we do truth? Yeah, exactly. does, does anyone do truth in that way? Right. Well, we don't. It's, it's outlandish because there's nothing for us to, to be able to weigh or to rationalize. So the gospel or the Bible teaches us that it's the same way. Matter of fact, the reason why uh, Jesus Christ has given us the Beatitudes, uh, he's telling us these are the objective, tangible marks of someone who's born again. 
because he's saying that this is not just based on a feeling because everybody can have a song, right? Uh, but it's not about feeling because I can feel happy today, but I can feel sad tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I can feel the next day, uh, you know, and somber. The next day I can, right? Emotions cannot be the measure of truth, right? So Jesus is saying the first thing that a person, that, that you, they would see in their life, right, is the fact that they're blessed, right? Uh, they're joyful because they understand that they're poor in spirit. But because they're poor in spirit, the kingdom of God is theirs, right? That's one of the marks. So if you've never seen yourself as spiritually bankrupt, then there's a, there's, there's a few things that I know that you probably don't know that maybe if I share with you can help you understand if you're spiritually bankrupt or not. You would have to, you're lacking the information in a sense. So the Bible says that all men born are sinful. Would you agree? Uh, you ever heard of the good person test? Good person test. So in the, in the Bible, there's a good person test, Exodus chapter 20. Uh, matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this so you can read it later. But let me, here, here's what it says. Check this out, right? And are you a good person? Right? This is what this track is about. It says, meet Mr. Nice Guy. If people go to heaven, he will be first in line. Well, hopefully you can be like that guy, right? And assume that he's lived a good life. He says, well, I try to do what's right. Uh, have you kept the commandments? And he says, pretty much. Do you know anything about the commandments, Ten Commandments? Can you think of any off the top of your head? Ten Commandments? Go ahead. Take a shot. The ones that come to your mind quickly. What are they? Respect thy neighbor or love thy parents, stuff like that. Yeah, to honor your parents. That's one. What's another one? Yep. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know as many as I thought I did. Okay. Okay, well, that's fine. We'll go through it together. No biggie. So, in a sense, now we're going to look at them. So, really, you know, do you mind if we look at them, right? So, I'm going to kind of essentially uh, go with this with you. So, we'll look at the commandments here and see if any of us have kept them. Have you ever told a lie? I guess that would be the first one for you. Yeah, yeah? of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, in our society, if you slander someone's character, what's the possibility of something that can happen to you? you publicly slander someone. Um... That's not a public person, Unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, not too much. Well, it the, happens so often. Yeah, the law says that you can go to court, you know, for misconstruing character. Yeah. Now, if you talk about the president or public figure, that's expected. But you can't just go slander around a person, right? Yeah. Right? You're, you're deconstructing their image. You can't do that. You go to jail for that because mm -hmm. now you're, the, their testimony of how people view them can affect their career. It can affect their lively income. They can affect a lot of things, you know? Yeah. So that even at, at a very legal sense, it's illegal. And that's lying. You go to the next one. It says here, um, have you ever stolen anything? Be the next one. No. No? So regardless of value and regardless of how old you were, have you ever taken something that wasn't yours forgot to give it back? I might have done something like that maybe. Right? So I'm a close friend or something. No. Yeah, yeah. No, of course you're not you're gonna walk into the bank and take a water fifties, right? Yeah. Here's a question. So how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Uh, I guess it depends how recent it is. Well, it doesn't matter because if you, how, how many people do you have to kill to be a murderer? Does that really matter how recent you did it? Right, so it doesn't matter. The standards are the same. We're the ones who make up those, conjure up those ideas. So how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? I guess it could be one. One. Most people think of liar as mm -hmm. a person who lies, not one who lied. Right, but really at the end of the day, I'm sure you've told more than one lie, yes? Probably. Right, not, so you're a liar. I mean, I remember, well, you've made it to lying, so I'm sure you have. <laughs> the second point is obviously, if you've taken something without permission, regardless of how you felt about it, if it was your friend or not, it's still, it's still theft. And the fact that you can't even keep track of it suggests, right, that you probably don't even know how much it's happened, but it's probably, if it was just one time, it would be very clear in your mind. So, in our society, we call people that take things and don't return them back, what? What do we call them? Whether intentionally or not, what do we call them? Thieves. Thieves. So, that'd be the second mark, right? So, here's the thing. It continues on, well, uh, whether it was a candy bar, pencil, or your buddy's baseball, whatever it was. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So Jesus says, right, that whoever looks at a woman to lust after has committed adultery in his heart. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, a little bit lower than what we're reading. So the idea of what Jesus is saying here is, let me help expound it. If you looked at a woman, right, all the thoughts that go through your mind, and she's attractive to your liking, uh, and we recorded everything that goes through your mind throughout the days you look at other women. And I put a huge 20 by 20 up there, and I start presenting it in 5.1 surround sound. W would you be a little concerned about how people would view you afterwards? Yeah, no one would want any uh, Right. You know, I want that happen. Right. And is that because you're a good person? Is that why people would not want to associate because you're such a good person? After your thoughts have been revealed on the screen? Oh, you mean yeah. shocking to what people... Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, so, it's, bit, yeah. so they would be shocked because, to your personal opinion, yeah, I consider myself to be a good person, having done bad things, but bad things in comparison to who? To everyone else? Yeah. So just the fact that you practice sin in your mind and can have fantastic thoughts and things of that nature doesn't mean that you're a good person. On the contrary, by this very example, it proves that you're not as good as you think you are. That's a serious problem. Here's another one. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Let's say, you know, you're driving, someone cuts you off, or something happens, or you hit your thumb, you know, with a hammer. You ever done that? A couple of times by accident. Yeah? Not, yeah, no. yeah listen, you don't get up in the yeah. morning on your agenda, things to do, and say, you know what, today I'm going to definitely blaspheme the name of God. Well, some people, it's just like every other word. Yeah, I mean, and it's unfortunately that they do that, and they, 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 they do the, the G-bombs, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But here's what's interesting. So, so far, by your admission, right, we know that you're a liar. You're definitely a thief, right? This is not something I'm pushing you to admit. This is something that you voluntarily are concluding, yeah, you know, based on the way I've done this, then that is true. So you're a liar or a thief. You're a blasphemer. And you've committed adultery in your heart. How? Well, because you've looked at women, several probably that, right, in your lifetime, and had sexual desires where in your mind you desire that woman, right, to the point that obviously you have impure thoughts. Impure thoughts just don't arrive. Impure thoughts are the result of desire, right? So, you broke God's commandment. Now, the question is this. You stand before the Lord on Judgment Day. God has everything taped, everything DNA'd. He can prove you're not as good as you say but you stand before him, does God have the right to judge you? Yeah. Right. So because, right, you're, you're an objective, rational man, is God going to let you into heaven or send you to hell because of your sin? I would say heaven. Heaven? So you have adamantly sinned against God and somehow you believe you're going to go to heaven? I'm just asking the question. Yes. How do you write to that? Well, I'm no expert, but mm -hmm. weighing the good and the bad... Mm -hmm. Good outweighs the bad by a lot. Okay. So in a sense, you were thinking more of a judicial system, right? Right. You're saying, you know the picture of the blind, justice is blind, or at least it's yeah. supposed to be, right? And it's got the blindfold and it's holding two ways and whichever one weighs higher, right? But, but the weights, let's think about this for a second to, to prove your point. Because I agree with what you're saying, but not completely, but here's how I'm going to express it. If we're going to put evidence to prove whether you've done more good and bad, have you really done that much more good versus sin? I think so, yeah. Mm-hmm. So everything that I've d d described about your secret sinful life that no one knows about. So in other words, you have months and months that go by when you don't sin. How old are you? 22. So you think in 22, you've maybe sinned what? One time, two times, three times. I mean, you can't even keep track of your sins. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah. Okay. So how do you know objectively, right, Mr. Engineer, <laughs> that you're good deeds outweigh your bad deeds yeah. how do you, well i don't know right but you're you're putting your faith that they you have more good deeds than your bad deeds yes right okay here's here's something that's not a trick question if all you ever did since you were born was lie one time would that get you to hell i hope not i agree i would hope not too uh, but the truth might be different and i don't like to say my opinion because who cares what i think i think what matters is god's word right it's authoritative Here's a little list for you to think about. So, Revelation 21, and we're going to go ahead and look at verse uh, 8. So, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, and verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, have you ever murdered anyone? No. Have you ever been angry at somebody and, and called them a bad name? Have you ever had a Probably. grudge against someone? You qualify for murder because that's what Jesus described as murder. Murder is not necessarily the act of killing. It's, it's the act of your heart. You have the motive. You ever see people can go to jail because they can prove motive? I've never had the motive to kill anyone, though. No, no, not necessarily. But the, the point is, if you were, uh, if someone transgressed against you, right, enough. If, if someone, some ISIS team member goes into you, your parents' live. Where do your parents live now? Where do they live? Yeah, they're, Titusville. Oh, Titusville. So they're over there. ISIS group goes in. Uh, rape your mom. Kill your dad. If you have siblings, they go and find out. They get shots in the head, right? This happens in cold blood murder. Burn your house, right? Your whole your whole history essentially of family's all been burned up. Um, you're just gonna say, you know what? It is what it is, and we're just gonna have to go to court. Or you're gonna feel some a little bit of fire. Oh yeah. Right. That that right there is murder. That's motive. That's if I could get away with setting these people straight and paying them according to what I think they deserve, right? Would be right. When in reality, the Bible says that the vengeance is of the Lord for those who are in Christ. You see, that right there 
is what Jesus judges as motive. Just like you don't have to touch a woman to be an adulterer, right? You did it. You did it where? Is that like saying that a jury would be murdered? If you're on a jury mm -hmm. and it's like a murder case, you're a murderer because you put him in jail? Uh, no, because of that, in that particular scenario, uh, jail isn't murder. We're not killing anyone. Matter of fact, uh, for someone to pay for their crime would be a good thing. Don't you agree? Yeah. Or do you want a bunch of pedophiles loose and rapists? Well, I mean, if you were to go and find those ISIS people, mm -hmm. that'd be the same thing. Well, well, you're presuming that I would do what? What do you mean? You're, if I found ISIS people, you're presuming that I would do what? Well, directly from the family mm -hmm. point of view. Right. Well, I would, as a Christian, I believe, right? I'm not going to say that um, the thought doesn't go through, but I would not have, right, unforgiveness or bitterness or hatred towards those people because they're godless, they don't know God, they've been lied to, they're deceitful people that believe a lie. That's no different than if I went up and I started being a quadriplegic because I'm asking him to walk and he can't. Lost people can't do righteousness. That's what the Bible says. People that are unconverted can't practice righteousness. So for me to assume that an ISIS member can practice righteousness and worship the true God is stupid because they don't. The very fact that they're an ISIS shows that they're godless people that believe a lie. Now, again, that would almost sound kind of crazy. The regular, like, man, you're, you're a little weak punk. You wouldn't want to get vengeance for what they do to your family. I'm not saying that a thought wouldn't go through my mind, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, build on it because I know that that's sin, and I know that that is sin against God. And my, my concern in my relationship with God is to honor who? Him. I don't do it for people. I do it for Him. You know, even if I'm, uh, you know, trying to avoid sexual immorality, avoiding sexual thoughts in my mind. I don't do it because I'm married. I do it because I love God and I want to live a life that's honoring to Him, right? If I want to share the gospel, as I've had the opportunity to talk to you today, why do I do that? Because I want to get brownie points, you know, because I'm going to go right there. Oh, hey, it's not even about that. It's about my love for God is demonstrated in wanting to share the truth with others, right? And that's just the way it works. So even the idea here, what, look, I'm going to keep on reading, right? We're still going through the list. It says the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexual moral. Have you been sexual moral? Have you had premarital sex or ever? No. Okay. Have you had sexual thoughts, like you said? Oh, well, yeah. Adult, right. So then it sends you are sexual moral, right? Because you've sinned in your mind. You're called an adulterer by Christ. Um, sorcerers, idolaters. Uh, have you lived a life that 100% all the time gives glory to God. You submit to all His commandments. Have you lived that life? So you're an idolater because if Christ isn't everything, then there's something else that isn't, that is everything that's not Christ. That's idolatry. You worshiping something else in a way that's not the way you ought to live for the glory of God. So watch what it says. So we have uh, sexual moral resources, idolaters, and all, I'm going to let you read that one, and all liars. liars. So anyone who's ever lied, right? It's not talking about liars as in how many lies you told. All liars. If you told one lie, you qualify. So if anything, you, if the only thing you've ever did in your life was lie, does that apply to you? Yeah. And look what it says here. And all liars will have their portion that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So the list, this is not a, an exhaustive list, right? But it does give us a list of the people that were going to go to hell. And liars are on that list. And you've not just lied, you've been an idolater you've committed sexual immorality so back to the question you stand before god god has god has right he's not blind by the way but to your point of justice is blind he's got all this body slamming evidence that you are you have broken his laws it is the righteous thing for him is just to let you go and not have your sin punished is that what good judges do well, what would you think if it was you what, what would I think what? If it was me? Yeah. N no different than what I believe objective truth tells us. In other words, even as an engineer, remember, detach your emotions. Because you, you, I know that there's a sense of, of, of pressure. Right? This type of conversation is a serious adult pressure and conversation. This is going to happen. But at the end of the day, we can't get emotional when we look at facts. You can't get emotional when you look at numbers right? and you're doing equations. Emotions have nothing to do with facts. I'm quoting facts. Like if I read the statues of Florida and said, you've broken the law, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how I feel. The guy reading them, if you broke the statue, you're right, and you get caught by the cops, you got to pay for it. If you ran the red light, you're going to get a ticket. If you were speeding, you're going to get a ticket if you get caught. You can't say, well, officer, how would you feel if you, that's, that's almost kind of offensive, right? So God doesn't, God's not saying uh, what you feel matters. God's saying, you've broken my law, and here's what I do with lawbreakers. So again, you've broken God's law. If God's going to be just, is He going to send you to hell, or is He going to let you enter heaven and rejoice with Him? Well, by the way you're asking, it have to be hell. But if that was the case, but it'd do be you like two people in 
Mm -hmm. Evans, never. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. I'm glad you're still being the engineer because you're thinking rationally. You're saying by that standard, which is what I'm saying, no one gets to heaven. Yeah. You're right. That's why I was trying to help you kind of line the idea of, okay, what are facts? What are facts? What is the conclusion of those facts? And what you just said is the conclusion of those facts. So the question is, how does anyone get to heaven? Repent. What does that mean? Apologize. Okay. The, uh, if I told my wife, honey, I'm sorry I cheated on you, but I go and do it again. Did I really repent? Well, no. No. What is repentance then? Give me a little bit more. Okay. I know. I know you know. You gotta mean it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Right. You gotta it, not just turn away from it. Right. So if you and I are going southbound and we repent of going to the beach, we're gonna go what? We're gonna go right. We're gonna go north. So really, it's, it sounds kind of funny, but repentance is a 180 degree turn on that very thing that God hates, and so. To your point, okay, so let's say you repent of sexual immorality in your mind. Is that what's going to get you to heaven? Is that alone what's going to get you to heaven? Well, obviously, if you don't do it anymore. Okay, so, so in other words, you're saying, God, look, I'm not sinning anymore. I deserve heaven. Is that an accurate statement of how people get to heaven? Somewhat. So you believe that the Bible teaches that people can get to heaven by doing good works? Not your question. And, well, I, do, and, I, and I do want your depends. honesty. Uh huh. Give me an explanation of it depends based on what you, you believe to be true. Well, you can't just do something good and then 10 minutes later go do whatever you want and be like, well, it doesn't matter because I just did that I yesterday. agree, yeah. So the question is, if I did something good, right? I'll give you a better scenario. You and I were super hardcore banker robbers, right, for 15 years. And then we turned good. We say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. That's wrong. We want to get married. It's just not a healthy life. Nobody ever caught us. Um, but then someone finds out that it was you and me the whole time. Do we then say to the judge for the past 15 years, we're taxpayers, right? We help old ladies across the street. We give money to the Red Cross. We go and serve, right? With, you know, um, when there's hurricane with FEMA. I mean, we've done a lot of good work. Does that undo everything else that we've done for the past 10? Well, from the justice standpoint, no, they want to care. Right, so, but remember, we're talking about God just, God being the ultimate example of justice. If God is just, does your good acts nullify the fact that you've sinned against him? I don't know, you probably have to pay for what you did beforehand yeah so here's the thing you either pay for it and we know that no one can go to heaven right uh without sin right so in other words unperfect people don't make it to heaven to your own point so then you're saying well but if you do good works and you stop doing what you did then that somehow merits your way to heaven but i'm saying it can't because if god is just you have if you made if you did the crime you got to pay the what the time so how do we resolve this particular conundrum it's a problem right because now you say, well, how do we get to heaven? I got to repent, which I agree. But the problem is, does repentance alone get you to heaven? The answer would be what? Well, what else, what else would we do? It's a good question. And I think you're in the right path. So here's what scripture says. And this should definitely be a means of, of clarity and of sobriety to your mind. Because here's what happens. The good news of the gospel that you have never been exposed to clearly, right, is the fact that God is holy Right? God made the world by the power of his hands, and then he came in human form, right, born of a virgin, right, and he lived a sinless life. He was able to obey all of the commandments of God, all ten of them. The ones you and I can't keep, he's kept. He fed people, healed people, preached the message of his father's kingdom, and they murdered him, they abused him, they mocked him, they crucified him. And here's what's really interesting that maybe you've never heard when Jesus was crucified, the reason that that's so important for anyone is because at the cross, there's a legal transaction taking place. All the perfect, the goodness, the holiness of Christ that he lived out is put on there, right? And he takes the wrath and the punishment for the sins of God's people. So, he is punished as a substitute for God's people. Now, I'll tell you what, that's a lot of sin. That's a lot of sin, and that's a lot of punishment, especially if you're going to suffer on the cross for three hours. How do you take an infinite amount of punishment that you should do, right, you and I would deserve in hell, times however many people have sinned, and compact that into three hours on the cross? That is even intangible if you really think about it, because it would almost, it, there's, there's certain aspects here that we really can't even comprehend mentally, right? That's just the way it is. But here's what happens, because Christ was 100% God, 100% man, at the cross, right, he atoned for the sins, of people who would repent and believe in him. So it's not just repentance that I'm going to stop doing this and do good things. Is I need to turn away from my sinful life, but I need to put my trust 
and faith in Christ. What does that mean? That I'm going to live a life that glorifies Him. I'm not going to get to heaven by my works, although I'm going to do what I believe the Bible calls me to do, but I'm not going to perfectly do it. So it can't be based on my merit that I get to heaven. It's going to be based on whose merit? God. That's right, Christ who paid the price for sin. This is a very serious subject because at the end of the day, what put Jesus on the cross is your sin. Your sexual morality, your lying, everything else that you've done that no one knows about, right, secretly, that's what put Jesus Christ at the cross. And so what you need to think about is, is the Spirit of God, right, as we're talking, doing a work in your life to convict you of your sin? If you're understanding this message and the Spirit of God is working in your life, you should start to feel a sense of pressure and hatred for your sin. The very things that you love to do that no one else knows you do, you should begin, right, if the Spirit of God is working in you, to hate those very things. See, what happened to you as a child when you were in that room was nothing. Here's why. Because it hasn't produced righteousness. It hasn't produced holiness. It was just something you felt. That's just all it is. Why? Well, I'm telling you why, based on objective, factual, biblical truth. None of that has given you a new heart. And so, if you have a repentance of your sin and put your faith in Christ, you're not born again, you're not a Christian, not by my own words. Listen, it doesn't matter what I think, it's based on what the Word of God says. And the fact that you uh, have been a Christian since however long, right, you said this happened, but you don't know the Scriptures, you don't know the Lord, you don't know the 66 love letters that Christ has written to people like you to, to show you how much he loves you. And you're not, you're not informed of who he is and his personhood and who Christ is and his deity. It shows that there's not really a relationship there. If you had a girlfriend and she sent you 100 letters throughout the whole year and you've never read them, it shows how, how little to none you hate that woman. Because if you love that woman, not only would you read the letter, but you would most likely respond to the letter because you love that person. The fact that you don't even have a desire, right? To seek God's word, you're not thirsting for righteousness like we were reading in the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are those who thirst for... You're not thirsting for righteousness because you don't have a new heart. You don't have a heart that desires the things of God. You don't have a heart that desires righteousness. Now, it doesn't mean you... You can be moral, right? And not be righteous. A lot of people are like that. Nice, moral people. You can be a Mormon and be moral. You can be Jehovah's Witness and be moral. You can be a Hindu and be moral. Does that get you to heaven? No, it doesn't. So what gets people to heaven is, right, they must repent and believe, put their trust in the gospel, put their trust in Christ. And so essentially, that's what Jesus says we must do. And that's the way we're able to take advantage of the gift of eternal life that he made available at the cross. How does any of this contradict what you believe, if there is anything? And really... You can take the horse to the water, but you can't make them drink it. So I agree. You gotta. I agree. Because everyone here knows. Well, not knows, but assumes to know. Assumes I would to say know, yes. Yeah, but if, if they're not willing pursuing it, they're just not pursuing it. Yeah. And so I, I'll encourage you with that. Um, if your sin is clear to you, and the Spirit of God has done a work in your life, you're gonna hate your sin. You're gonna hate the very fact that you're a wicked man in places in your heart and mind that no one knows. And that essentially your life is really a facade. It's really hypocrisy, really, because there's parts that you would never really manifest because it would bring shame to your name, to your family's name. You're not being, a, you're not being an honest man. You're definitely not being righteous before God. And your sins are stacking up. And you don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. I don't know that either. So my genuine concern is if you die today, where will you go? And that should be sombering enough to make you understand, I need Christ, I need a Savior, because I'm not good enough, and I know you're not good enough. And listen, understand this, I'm not here doing the condescending, I'm holier than thou. I'm not holier than no one. I deserve hell probably worse than you do for a, a numerous amount of sins, right? But I praise God that some at one point shared the gospel with me, and the Spirit of God convicted me of my sin. And it, it's you see, the, one of the things the Spirit of God is it, it convicts of sin and righteousness. And so if the Spirit of God is convicting you of sin and righteousness, you need to cry out to Him. You need to call upon His name, right? Because at the end of the day, the number one person you're hoping, right, will give you mercy is the number one person who is going to judge you and make your life miserable in hell. And that's just the reality. And so again, I encourage you, think that through. You know, keep the track. Uh, I pray that the Lord works in your life, you know. Uh, do you go to church now? No, I haven't been in a while. What's, what's kept you away? Just don't want to go. It's, just, it's not interesting. It's not your thing. I don't know. Yeah. 
just I guess mm-hmm. all the above. Just, I mean, mm-hmm. if I don't go, I don't go. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Well, I, I encourage you. I mean, if do you want to go? You can say no. It doesn't offend me. I'm, I'm just trying to facilitate multiple options on how I could try to help you. No, sometimes I do, and sometimes mm-hmm. I'm like, I need to find a close, casual church around here, and mm-hmm. then I just don't follow up on it, and that's okay. just how that goes. Okay, so what can I do to help you if there's anything? Nothing you can do. I just got to help myself is what it is. Do you think that's going to continue to go well or bad based on track record? I don't know. So based on your track record, you don't know how it's going to turn out? No. Your pursuit of God? I mean... But do you, would you say that you've been apathetic to seek the Lord? I mean, I don't know. Apathetic means that there's not a genuine desire or passion to seek Him. It's just kind of mellow. Mm-hmm. Okay. In your relationship, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Can well, you even have a relationship with that type of attitude? Well, of course it's a bad thing. Right. So in a sense, you have been apathetic because you haven't been seeking Him, which means if you're stagnant or anything below, would be would be something that... And again, you know... Um, I don't, I don't, um, I don't want you, my, right, honestly, you don't go to serve God because you're scared. You don't serve God because you avoid hell, right? That's not the motivation here. The motivation here is Christ and His holiness and that He's so good and so loving but so righteous that He's provided a way for you to have a possible escape of the wrath of God. Man, praise God. No one else is going to do that for you. And, and listen, if we're going to be honest, you and me are pile of trash. Nobody wants to say that, right? It sounds kind of like not nice to yourself. But it's truth. The wicked man, and so you need the grace of God to deliver you from that. You can't. Do you understand that you're not going to hate sin until God gives you a new heart? You're not going to hate it. You're going to think about it. You're going to dwell on it. You're going to plan it. And you're going to do it in a way where nobody knows. And still keep up your, you know, your, your righteous appearance of morality to people. That's going to get you to hell, bro. And I, and I don't, God doesn't want that for you, which is why I thank God we got to talk. You understand, this isn't like a church recruiting thing. I can care less because of my church. But if you're in Christ, you're a new creature, and you have eternal life, and you live for the glory of God, not for yourself. Right now, you're just living for yourself. And, and, and that ends up in hell. And boy, is that going to break my heart on Judgment Day when God gives everybody, right, what they deserve. And I'll see you eye to eye and know that we had this conversation, and I'll feel sadness in my heart because... That guy, that nice guy who's got nice family, decided to live a life for himself and not for the glory of God. So think these things too because they're very serious things. You might not take them as serious, but they're very serious because it will determine the outcome of where you will be eternally. Now you might say, well, I'll just do it as I get older. That's very presumptuous because you don't even know if you'll be alive tomorrow. You know that God, you're, you're living off of God's credit on air and oxygen Right, your whole uh, uh, card, cardiovascular system—it's borrowed. You're a steward of what God has given you, and you're presuming on His grace to continue your sin. That is—that is horrible. But that's the way people live. And so what I'm saying is, consider that, think about that. It might not all happen today. I understand that, but I do want to get you to really think, right, and pray that the Spirit of God would do a work in your heart that makes you understand. Right? Once and for all, that you need Christ, that you need a Savior, you need atonement, you need forgiveness. Because apart from that, you're just bound to hell. And listen, there's nothing happy in hell. The Bible says hell is a dark place where people burn, where worms eat your flesh that never ends up, you know, degenerating. And it's complete dark and, and it's fiery. You know there's dark spots in the sun, yes? Are they off? There's no heat there? No. They're very hot. So hot that they don't have to emit light. That's how hell is like. And you, so I don't want you to go there. And God has allowed for me to come here and talk to you because you have a need for a Savior to encourage you to do that. So um, will you serve the Lord? Will you seek Him? Right? You don't have to answer that because I'm not looking for a commitment. Who cares what you tell me? You can fool me. Is You need to find, you need to get right with the Lord because He's been so good to you and you've been so evil to Him. And the Bible says that God will not contend with man with you forever. He's not going to continue this form of grace where he's giving you time and time and time. And you think you're just getting away with it possibly in your mind, but you're not. It's, it's all, all these sins are stacking up. And whether you die now or on judgment day, God's going to give you the true value for your sin, which is hell. And you have the slightest idea of what that is. If I told you, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to turn on a lighter and I want you to hold your hand in the fire, in the fire 
for a straight minute and I'll give you 20 bucks, would you do it? Would it, right? Okay, here's a better idea. That's a cheesy example. What if I said, I'm going to give you $2 million for your right eye? Actually, no. Let's make it a juicier deal. I'll give you $2 billion for your right eye. Would you give up your eye? I'd have to think about it. <laughs> you had to think about it? Yeah. So you would know it's mutilate your own body for money? Is that how little you think of yourself? Well, it depends what that money could be used for, not just to buy fancy cars and stuff. Right. You know, you, to a certain degree, I know how you're thinking about this, but let me encourage you to say that it's ignorant. Here's why. Because you don't, you're, you're saying that you don't value your sight. But you wouldn't know that because you take it for granted. Well, you yeah. still see. Yeah, but you don't understand what it is to see in mono as it is to see in stereo. And again, you wouldn't know that because you've never had to deal with it, right? So the point is, is this. Jesus says if your right eye causes you to go to hell, rip it out. You're not even willing to do that to, get, to serve the Lord. But you do it for money. That's how idolatrous you are. You would consider doing it for money, but you wouldn't consider, right? And of course, Jesus is not really calling you to take out your eye. He's saying whatever inhibits you from serving me, take it out. And he's, he's being, using hyperbole. If your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off. Well, no, you would actually probably would cut it off for money if it was good enough of an offer. But you wouldn't do it for the glory of God. That's how wicked and idolatrous your heart is. Again, think about these things because God has been very good to you. Well, listen, I'm going to head out, but I thank you for your time. And again, I, I really want you to know I'm not, I'm not here to beat you up, bro. You know, And, and this, this, this is an adult conversation. This isn't a little pansy this is an adult conversation, and there's very aggressive things that I've told you here. And, I, and I'm going to pray that God will do a work in your heart. Your family, if they're not converted, your family needs Christ. If you have siblings, they need Christ. And how sad would it be that on Judgment Day, if you end up in hell because you don't repent and believe the gospel, you can, they're going to be there and it's all your fault because you knew this truth. And instead of serving the Lord and going to tell them about it, I'm not going to do that because... You have to think about all, all these different things that are a reality of what God's going to hold you accountable for. Uh, and I believe that God has demonstrated His love by allowing me to be here today to talk to you about the gospel and encourage you that you need to turn away from your sin and seek the Lord. Any questions? You good? Sir, you've been a gentleman. I appreciate it. I'll leave, you, I'll leave you these two little things when you get a chance. If you want to just kind of dig a little bit more and go through your Bible. And, um, yeah, I'll be praying for you. You know, that the Lord would do a work in your life because... I, 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 get just, I get really depressed, you know. I meet nice people, and I don't want to see them blow their life and go to hell. It just, it just breaks my heart. So have a wonderful day, and good luck in your studies, okay? Take care. Mm -hmm. No problem.